All right, so uh, we have the entrepreneurial panel here now after the venture capitalist panel, although you do have one venture capitalist here. So, uh, but we'll, we'll focus this one on the entrepreneurs and those who are building some really interesting uh, services across the IoT and data space and get their perspectives. And we'll try and keep it lively. It's the you know, end of the day, so thanks for hanging in, and we will try and make it useful uh, for you. So, uh, so let's, uh, uh, let's jump into the, uh, to in the introductions first. My name is Anupam Rastogi. I work with a venture fund called Nokia Growth Partners, focused around IoT and analytics and digital health. Uh, have a, about a billion dollars in the management growth stage investment focus. Uh, well, uh, why don't we go around? We have three uh, uh, very eminent uh, panelists here from uh, who are all entrepreneurs, and maybe spend a minute each uh, introducing yourself and what your company does, so that we have context for sort of the further questions that are coming up. Okay, uh, my name is Dave Friedman. I'm the CEO of a company called Ala Networks. We basically do exactly what Alex said he never wants to see. So it's a very horizontal, broad IoT platform. Um, actually, we did talk to Alex at one point. But uh, it turns out it is actually kind of effective if you can make it work. And so our platform is used by giant manufacturers to enable connected products to uh, actually get launched and then manage the devices and data. So my name's Scott Jar. I'm with, uh, I started a company called VoltDB. It's uh, even more horizontal uh, than, than you guys. It's almost, we should be in the horizontal vertical order here, but um, we're a database. We're an in-memory database that's used for transaction processing. And one of the key applications that we find a lot of use in is, is IoT, because it, it actually, uh, even though you have tons of streams of data coming in, they actually are actionable devices at the end, and they're becoming more actionable. So there you go. I'm Vladi Shuntrov, uh, founder and president of Lucid. Uh, we're a SaaS company in the commercial building space. And so we actually started with a single solution that we started selling and then built a platform for uh, building technology, building IoT, which now supports 180 different types of data streams for various manufacturers, legacy and new. Um, and then we built the platform to enable us to build a lot more solutions. Um, but what we really solve is the last mile problem of IoT which is how do you make the data valuable uh, for the business uh, that needs it and how do you actually end up with not a bunch of stranded infrastructure, but infrastructure that delivers value to the business. So we build enterprise software for uh, large commercial portfolios of commercial building owners and operators. Great, thank you. Uh, so uh, in this panel, we'll focus on you know, where the value is being created within IoT and analytics. and. Uh, and so why don't we jump into, uh, you know, so there's a lot of different verticals, industry verticals, and there's a lot of uh, different parts in the value chain one can play in. Uh, where do you see from an industry vertical perspective, where do you see, uh, you know, more traction in IoT versus less in terms of actual rubber hitting the road? You know, there's a lot of hype in the space, a lot of excitement at uh, the top level and strategic le levels, but in terms of actual execution and implementation, where do you see the most uh, value being created by vertical first? And if you want to start with okay. Dave. Yeah, I'll, I'll try and be quick. So. Uh, the challenge of IoT is the word is things. It's so broad that it's really just the internet and technology coming together to expand it to automotive, factories, refrigerators. In our particular, what we decided is to focus on the manufacturers targeting the home or light commercial because they, they move very high volume and they, they work much faster than guys going after utilities or industry. Um, so Ayla's customers, and we're finding a lot of traction here, are companies like Fujitsu or Hisense or TCL or um, large appliance companies. And essentially, these companies do not have what Tony Fidel built at Nest. Essentially, what we do is a horizontal platform that it's not directly built for one thermostat. It's leverageable across a whole bunch of enterprises that instead of hiring 20 people or 50 people to build it, they pay us and use our services. So they are manufacturers targeting home and light commercial for us today. Yeah. And, uh, and what are the primary two or three reasons they're looking to connect these devices to the internet? Uh, is it that their customers are really banging on their doors asking for it? Is it you know, something else? What's driving their uh, need for that? You know, the, the fir one first driver is Nest 
we, we came out, and we, it was hard to sell in 2011. We have a platform for Internet of Things. I guess if you guys are founders, too, you just know there's a lot of uh, uh, blood trying to raise money. Um, and we were saying platform for Internet of Things. Then Nest launched, and we said, like that, and then we got, we got a term sheet. And then we got Johnson Controls and Unite Technology. So our earliest customers were copying these fast, you know, these vertical guys in the market. That was one. The second thing is basically we are seeing HVAC, moving air and water and the savings and energy efficiency and doing it smarter and more efficiently. So we have A.O. Smith water heaters and a lot of air conditioning companies. The third one is that these guys do see, they read in Business Week today, big data. And it's not hard to sell. You will change how you have inventory and management and data. These companies spend tens of millions of dollars a year on truck rolls and warranty, and even doing warranty coverage for products that are covered, but they were sent back and they still work. They would like to eliminate that waste. Those are the drivers. Got it. And uh, Scott, with uh, WorldDB as a horizontal platform, uh, you sell into a number of you know, industry verticals. So uh, where do you see what are some verticals where uh, the traction is more imminent with, with IoT and connected devices? Yeah, sure. So it's, it's funny, when, when we think of at VoltDB, we think of IoT as a vertical. So you know, it's always one of those things you can get closer and closer to the point where you're horizontal or when you're vertical. But um, IoT is one of our verticals. But within that, there are segments where we're seeing a lot more action than, than others. Um, interestingly, one of the ones that we see is the utilities. It is those big, large projects. So we have um, several utilities in Japan with uh, OEM partners that we have, like Mitsubishi. We have um, a large utility rollout in the United Kingdom, all the smart meters there. These are massive, massive projects. And when they start to look at those projects, you talked about the value split up within one of these projects. We're a database. We're one piece of it. There's cell towers. There's real estate. There's power generation plants, there's utilities. These are really, really monstrous projects. So they take a long time, but there's huge value in them. There's many, many millions of dollars, up to billions of dollars in some of these projects. So utilities is a big one. Um, then I think after that, it's, it's really very much, um, well, I should say mobile is big. You, know, I, you guys might not think of mobile. We think of mobile very much as IoT in some ways because the difference between my mobile phone and a smart meter can be very little. You know, I, I have a really specific use case where Mitsubishi does things with smart meters and usage on a uh, per event basis. It's exactly the same thing as some of our telco customers use for usage on a per event basis and hitting pricing tiers. So they're very similar use cases. Um, so we see a lot in mobile. And then after that, they become really the standard M to M. You know, it's just the single vertical app that we're powering, but it, it would be something like Vladdy's company. So we've seen it in gaming tables, we see it in race management, we see it in uh, you know, personable wearables, kind of interesting things like that. But mobile and telco are really um, two of the big ones in utility. Sounds good. And uh, Vladi, thoughts on in, uh, you know, specific in industry verticals and you're specifically within the building space. So perhaps the second part of the question to you specifically would be also how have you seen that uh, the you know adoption appetite in that space change amongst the customer set over the last you know five seven years that you've been doing this uh, have things changed materially or is it more sort of linear change in their sort of uh, appetite for deploying IoT or connected device type solutions? So I think the verticals that matter um, actually you can look at GE to and see what they care about and they care about assets that are valuable so they care about. Uh, Big industrial, they care about transportation, they care about healthcare, and they care about buildings uh, with, with uh, their current effort on predicts. And so, and GE, you know, full disclosure, is actually an investor in our company. But um, if you look at what we're focused on as commercial buildings, you know, commercial buildings represent 15% of GDP. And, and let that number sink in because if you look at a map of all the software analytics and intelligence companies, uh, it dwarfs uh, sort of the overall uh, spread of companies, even at MarkTech, uh, and the, the piece of the pie is much larger. So the opportunity is massive uh, in buildings alone because the assets are running very inefficiently because they're not data-driven. Buildings today largely are not a data-driven industry, and that's changing pretty rapidly. I think if you look at uh, the telltale signs of an industry that's changing, that's beginning to adopt data, it's uh, you begin to see job descriptions pop up. 
uh, on uh, job boards looking for uh, heads of data administration for building data. So the CIOs are beginning to say uh, data on our buildings is a key business asset that we got to care and protect and organize and normalize and make sure we're using it in our business process. And so we are literally have seen about a dozen of our customers hire dedicated data administrators. And you know we're a company of 60 people. We have a dedicated Salesforce administrator because to us, our customer data is really valuable. We want to make sure we have efficient data-driven operations as a company. Um, and so we're beginning to see that uh, certainly take place with large commercial building owners and operators. Great. So uh, maybe then digging into specific business models that uh, that you're seeing that work or that you think uh, work, and and you know there's obviously a lot of different uh, places to play in the IoT space. There is obviously there's services, there's hardware, and then you know within software there's you know you, you could have software as a service, but then even within that you have a per device model, which uh, I think Ela has, Dave, uh, where you monetize on a per device basis potentially. Or it could be based on you know number of seats or number of nodes, uh, 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 for example, with VoltDB, and uh, or it could be a verticalized system like uh, uh, like with Lucid. So if you could reflect on uh, different business models within the IoT space and uh, what what works and what doesn't in your experience. Okay, for for us. Um we are more often selling, it's sort of who you're selling to will help determine your business model. So we are essentially enterprise software and services, but we sell to the VP of product or the CEO and they're gonna connect all their fans, Hunter fan or something. And so the model kind of has to fit what these guys do. Now we are, our biggest competitor also is make versus buy. It's that simple. They say, well, I have an IT group and I can make this work on Amazon or Azure. And we sort of say, well, look, we have about 80 engineers doing this. We wish we had 300. And we make it on Amazon. And so it's, it's an extremely complex challenge to do what we do very well. So we help them understand at least a business model that would be, look, if you did it yourself on Amazon or Azure, it would be this much. And basically, they would use transactions. They would do a lot of compute or a little compute. But we also help them understand if you just hire 10 people, <laughs> you're paying $2 million every year, and, and so on. So we, we help them understand more like an enterprise software sale and show them what the cost would be if they run it themselves. Okay, so basically aligning it with what their alternatives are and yeah. how they would think about it otherwise. And the applications are separate. Then we say, well, it looks like you have maybe $50 million of inventory at any one time in the channel, and our customers have started to shave, say, two days of inventory, and so it looks like you might be able to have this type of benefit as well. That's how we sell the applications on top of sort of the basic OS layer in the cloud. Makes sense. Scott? No, I, I was going to, I love what you said in the beginning, right? It, it depends upon who you're selling to, yeah. right? It, it really matters if you're selling to, well, I'll give you a perfect example. We could sell to either of these guys, right? Or we could sell to Nokia, one of our customers. And you all are buying in different ways. So as a truly infrastructure product, we have to be able to uh, adapt to that, which I think is very different than if you're selling to the building management. It's just a different model because it's what that customer ultimately expects. So in certain cases, in, in some of the very large, like I, I mentioned the Great Britain one, they want to they want a fixed price. They want to understand what that looks like. But then there's other cases where you can very well uh, assume and imagine where they want to know a per washing machine price, right? I'm going to add it to my bomb. I want to know what that bomb has in terms of gross profit, and therefore it's a very defined, knowable cost in the beginning. A fixed price for them doesn't work. So you find out, find yourself. We find ourselves being a little bit pliable in that way because we have to. I think, I think in a, it's, a, it's basic math in a high standard deviation market, new market, high fragmentation. If you say, this is how I do business and I only do it this way, you're going to leave a lot behind. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And we've seen as our market in commercial buildings um, has matured and changed over time. We've seen different models. Traditionally, it's been a highly verticalized model from the Johnson Controls of the world, the Siemens of the world, where you come in and uh, you sell a bunch of hardware uh, that costs a ton of money, uh, software that you pay upfront for that's so difficult to manage that you got to use services from the, the above mentioned companies to actually make these technologies work and maintain them. And that was usually purchased with a CapEx budget. Um, 
how things are changing is that obviously now everyone is moving to a SaaS model for the software piece and you focus on self-service and ease of use so that you can self-manage your assets or use consultants of your choice. So you're really moving to a horizontal model of hardware uh, from a whole bunch of different vendors that connects to software that makes it all work together to your people or your favorite service providers. So the customer has choice and can assemble best of breed solutions. Along that path, I think the customers have sort of switched their mentality, certainly beginning to switch to use operational funds to subscribe to software services, they get that. Where we've seen the market struggle a little bit is some of the hardware companies that make some of the really innovative sense sensing solutions, they have these hybrid models where they both want to charge for the hardware and they want to charge a subscription. And that just doesn't, it doesn't work. The customer doesn't buy it, it doesn't move forward. So you sort of either need to sell an asset and the customer buys it and owns it, or you need to sell data as a service, and you got to fund just like you know with a cell phone plan. You got to fund the hardware somehow. So I think that's one of the challenges. If you're a hardware company, it's hard to go and raise money from uh, the venture guys uh, without subscription revenues. Just if you're selling boxes, it doesn't work. So I think that pressure has pushed hardware companies to charge service fees, but the customers are pushing back. So you kind of have to pick one: either charge for the data or charge for the device. It's interesting. None of our customers charge a service fee. They're they. They buy ours, and this is how we ha we knew we had to do this in the beginning. Is even though we have basically a monthly Amazon expense, they use it service as a component. The we charge them for three years or five years. Um, you should talk to some of these guys. But they they would then the, the service is built into the bill of materials. They know for the next five years what it'll be. Yeah, and that's what we see works is five years of prepay, and then yeah. you make it someone else's problem down the line. Well, that's because that's your, their ultimate customer is the guy that, me, that bought a refrigerator. And I don't want to go and buy a service fee associated with that, so it's going to get passed through. Yeah. Do you see that buys. change for some categories at least with, uh, you know, now if you look at your Comcast box, you're paying monthly fee for that. People are paying that for security cameras. And so, so the number of categories where you're paying monthly fees is actually going up. Uh, and if you just look five or 10 years back, the number of subscriptions I had was probably close to zero. Uh, and you know, now if you sum up, a lot of our, us are paying for tens, if not more, you know, different services, not just home appliances, but across subscriptions for you know, music and uh, some of these home appliances. So do you see, think, uh, or you know, I mean, not yet home appliances, but you are still paying for your Comcast box, which used to buy outright earlier, right, for instance. So do you see that change? Uh, any I hope not. Future? I mean, I, you know, those are historically subscription-based because they're ARPU guys. So the ARPU guys who've always been taking a monthly continue to add more and more stuff to that. So security is coming in through those boxes. But um, I, I, uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I actually hate it. I, every time I see someone taking a nickel from me for something stupid like that, I'd, you'd rather pay $25 and not have to think about it more for the product, but I, I, um, I'm a sample of one. Yeah, yeah, uh, <laughs> makes sense. Any any differing views on that? Actually, from the in the, in the consumer for... space, certainly, you know, I, you know, I just got the outdoor Nest Cam, and it's great, and I can use it without a subscription. If I want the extra stuff, I can pay the subscription. I think you have the choice of how you want to use it. I think in an enterprise context, it's a lot more difficult because you've got to convince a bunch of stakeholders that they should set aside operational budget to do it. So there's a lot more scrutiny. And then you do have to show the ongoing value and defend it. If you can defend the value, great. But I think with, with if it's just if when there's alternatives, when you can go and buy, let's say, a data integration box uh, from Intel that is a fixed cost or from Tritium that's a fixed cost, it's really difficult to make the case that you should buy someone else's box and also pay a subscription. Um, I think there's enough alternatives in the traditional uh, technology space for enterprises that is just fixed assets. Okay. Then maybe changing gears into uh, your effort, Vladdy, to uh, customer requirements. And so especially in the enterprise space, how, uh, you know, how feasible is it to actually productize some of these offerings versus you know, with the requirements being so different between different customers? Uh, there's always this pull towards customization and services and doing something specific for especially larger customers, right? So uh, uh, how feasible do you see in each of your industries sort of uh, you know, productizing these offerings versus having to continue, continually packaging it with services, which may not be a bad thing, uh, you know, depending on what you want to do, right? So, the, uh, because, uh, so, so maybe starting with you, Vladi, how, uh, how do you see it in your industry? I mean, so we build software to support um, a set of business processes. Uh, they have different use cases associated with them. And so um, 
we certainly operate in a space where the business process hasn't been standardized the way it has been in sales and marketing, for example. And the reason why we have standard process in sales and marketing is because we all use sales and marketing automation tools and enterprise software to manage our process. So part of it is we go with customers and we have what we call uh, the Lucid methodology, which is how we believe the business process should run in an organization that is data driven. We educate them. They may not be there, but we help them get there and they become a very sticky customer. So we sort of squeeze the customers to standardize to us because otherwise, to your point, you're going to be building highly customized solutions that don't scale across a very large industry. Thoughts on that? Uh, I'm again. I'm a little bit of the oddball here. I think because what we're doing is we're disrupting a, a very standardized industry. Right? It's a SQL database. It's been around for 40 years. So when when I look at that, our push is customers are pushing us to be more of the standard, and we're pushing back on that, saying, look, that that's not that relevant anymore. Don't worry about that, or this stack is split into two, and we're only doing this part of it. So we're a little bit on the different side of this, but still to the same problem. We're not gonna go customize or add features that are specific for one set of customers when we know that there's a broader market in another area. Makes sense. Yours is naturally more, much more horizontal, and, uh, so, so, yeah, and it's much more clear what the customer expects. Uh, and David, yours is an industry where I would imagine from the outside that there would be a lot of pull in terms of customers on what they want. Uh, uh, so, so how, how do you manage that? And yeah, it, it actually takes very patient investors and then discipline because we we have massively fragmented customers. We have retailers and air conditioning guys and door lock, but we have this no line of code for anyone. And so if someone wants a feature, we sort of look at across the sets of customers and we build the feature because it would be shared by a lot. Um, it, you, you don't grow as fast by saying no to you. There's these deals that come in and the you know, sales guy is just dying. It's a big, big deal. And you, you need to say no because you think in two years it's going to be a giant anvil around your neck. Um, but so far, the slow and steady approach has been effective. But it takes a lot of discipline and pain, yeah. saying no. That's a tough rope walk. Uh, then a uh, question about uh, you know, st uh, startups or s smaller companies versus larger companies, and especially in the enterprise and for critical things like the you know, IoT, connected devices, data, space, uh, there's obviously a natural pull. There's some factors which are a natural pull towards larger companies, and you know, there are all these. Things. Okay, no one ever gets fired for buying from IBM, or you know, you need someone who you can call, and there are all these bigger companies would often underwrite liabilities and things of that nature. So, how do you overcome that as a younger uh, company? And uh, where do you see? Are there specific spots? in the value chain or in the product chain where it's, you know, which are better suited for startups versus large companies in your respective uh, fields? Well, I think this is where Alex is probably right, too. If you go very broad, it, we looked at our first customers and frankly thought they were crazy. There were eight of us, and our early guys were like Johnson Controls, United Technology, but you have to maybe solve the problem so different and fast and more efficient, more secure, whatever, that they sort of need to rely on you. But our, in our business, we are, the bad analogy, but like AT&T for all their product. It is a network, it keeps them alive, we have to give them high availability, and they're multi-billion dollar companies. Most of our customers are not the maker, they're the guy already selling millions and millions of units. I don't know how you get there. It, it is a, I, I don't know, most companies you should start in a vertical and be the very best and start broadening. It, that is actually the best way to do it. But you, everyone aims towards that. We think now we are the lowest risk option. I mean, we're lower risk than IBM in our space because we've shown, and by the number of customers we have, nothing's probably, eventually you get to the point where your customer base is how you sell. You, do, you say, well, look, of course I'm selling, but look at these guys and why they've used it. And you can call them. But it takes, how you get there, you look back sometimes down and you say, well, I did, and, and you know. And it's rarely by the textbook. <laughs> no, no, it's never. There's no, yeah. Yeah, we did it. Um, we kind of went that path a little bit, I guess, in some ways. But the thing I always try to do is I, I look at markets evolving in three different ways. You know, they're, they're in one way in three steps. 
either I have to go out and educate about pain and tell people they're in pain and have to convince them that there's in pain. That's terrible, right? I never want to do that. Expensive. Second one is they're in pain, but they don't think there's a way to solve it, right? That one's really hard, too, because they, they don't believe you. You can go all day long and talk to them, and they don't believe that you have the solution. And then there's the third category, that they're in pain, they know there's a solution, they believe that it can be solved because they've seen others doing it, and the major vendors can't do it for them. And, and that's the space that we started in, right? We, we weren't going, just to kind of give you the frame of reference here, Oracle's sort of our big, nasty, ugly competitor. There's a little company up the road. And, you know, when we go to them, when we go to customers, we say, well, can they do it for you? And if the answer is no, then we have the foot in the door already. If the answer is yes, and then I have to defend why my yes is better than their yes, I'm going to lose every single time because we're 50 guys, they're 50,000 guys, or however many they are. So we're always looking for spots where there's a known pain, they're trying to solve it, there's business value behind that, and it's something they can't do somewhere else or have to do somewhere else with another startup at a different trade-off. It's interesting, if you have to evangelize, you're, oh, oh man, exactly. So there has to be yeah. a pain point and you have a solution which is unique and solves that problem and then basically expand from there to the point where you become the safer or better option uh, yeah, but, even if the large company then I eventually think so. comes in. Nothing really beats timing and then your team. And I guess you guys know that is that the timing trumps everything. You have the best technology in the planet and you have to tell people why it's important. You just have a couple more years until you don't, and you're going to be burning money. Yeah, I was going to say that. But you never know that in the beginning, right? When you right. start, because we, we all start these things way before the market gets interested in them, right? Yeah. So you start this thing, and man, we were blessed because big data came along, right? There's nothing that Volt could have done or the other 35 startups that were out there in our space could have done to make that kind of PR, that kind of awareness in the market. But it came, right? And it was, it was huge and it drove all of us. And then lo and behold, IoT comes out and that's another one. But you don't know those up front, but that's what will drive you ultimately to getting the kind of traction that you need. Yeah. From when we started in the kitchen, you, you could buy IoT platform Google AdWord for like a nickel. And now it's like 10 bucks. And <laughs> it's just so funny. And I, I laugh when I say I'm on IoT platform. In the beginning, it was like every, every one of you guys is on a BlackBerry, and they're like, what's, what's that? And platform sounds expensive. What's IoT? And so the market, you're right, you can't buy the fact that now our customers are reading this stuff in People Magazine, maybe. You know, it's everywhere. Right, so. right, right. For us, it was selecting a vertical. So within commercial buildings, there's government, there is education. They own a lot of commercial buildings. Uh, there's corporate campuses like Genetics, Sony, Google, etc., Nokia, and then there's um, and then there's the multi-tenant uh, commercial real estate. So those are kind of the big guys uh, with most of the buildings that matter. Um, we decided to go after education because it's a fairly forgiving vertical. Because if you screw up and you don't have total product fit, it's okay and I understand iteration. And we also didn't raise money for the first decade that we were in business. We were a cash flow positive company. So we went and sold product that people bought and were ready to spend enough money on and we slowly built a team to about 30 people before we went and took money. Um, so we timed the market. The, if we had raised money earlier, we just we were gonna burn it. Um, we couldn't really scale a business because the market couldn't support it, but then the market caught up really fast. Um, and so we also operated in a space for getting to product fit on the enterprise capabilities takes a very long time because you need a very complete solution that supports dozens and dozens and dozens of use cases across multiple stakeholders. Um, so it takes time to become a mature solution that has all the enterprise capabilities, all the security capabilities that the enterprise wants to see. Um, and then you're really the only one left because there's a lot of roadkill that didn't quite make it. So the commercial buildings has been a space that's been challenging to crack from a software perspective because getting to product fit takes a long time, and that's how we've done it. Pick a vertical that's forgiving, grow to reach maturity, and time when you raise money so you can actually put fuel in the fire where it's actually will be effective. Did you, uh, can I ask him a question? <laughs> All right. Uh, well, did you start with one part of a smart building for education then versus broadly horizontal smart buildings? No, we started with a solution that people wanted to buy, a software app, it doesn't matter what it did, people wanted it, and we realized that buildings weren't ready for software because when we went and sold it, we couldn't implement it because every building had different infrastructure. And we were foolish enough to think that there's a finite set of solutions that's less than 10 that we would connect to and will be done. 
and we just keep building driver after driver and then we realized that what the market really needs because we knew all these other apps that people would want to buy what the market needed was sort of, sort of an operating system layer that abstracted the hardware from the software so you can sell software so our goal as a company is to bring every building online so we can create a software marketplace and we can really sell enterprise software to buildings to us that's the last remaining digital transformation uh, that will have a massive impact across the economy. Uh, but that's the barrier to get over is connectivity and normalization of devices and vendors. Great. Let me uh, uh, pause there and see if there's any, uh, any questions from the audience at this point. Do have one or two more questions, but want to make sure we address any questions from the audience. Um, the question was, have we seen uh, successful business models where you bundle some kind of third-party service or in-home in -home service uh, with some kind of box that you're selling? So it's really hardware, software plus services. Um, in, in complex industries like buildings, uh, customers want that. So they, we, we don't, we don't want to build a service organization within our company. But we have partnered with people who do instrumentation, sensing, sensor installation of buildings. They do energy management consulting services. And our sales reps just have the price list. And if you want to get someone to drop in and install meters in your building, then we have a price and then someone comes and does that. Or if you want someone to consult you on your uh, energy management strategy, we have people that will drop 20 hours with your team. And that uh, tends to sell really all. People want that kind of full you know, red carpet turnkey service. Okay, let me ask one more question then uh, on horizontal versus vertical. And we were just um, chatting on this before the panel, but um, there are different views on this. And we, on, on the previous panel, we had uh, this view on uh, how can you have horizontal uh, platforms within, uh, within the IoT space. Uh, but then there is, uh, you know, so that there are views both ways. So why, why don't we get each of the panelists' views on how feasible are horizontal, or what functionalities do you see being a better fit for having a horizontal platform, and then are there things which are more naturally vertical, or is it one versus the other? Do you see some of these industry solutions just being so vertical that, you know, let's say fleet industries are so different from building industries, so different from education or whatever, that uh, these solutions are going to be just totally vertical? That's one extreme view of the word. The other extreme view of the word is, you know, look, everything is horizontal, uh, and, uh, you know, there's going to be some customization. But so, so those are two extremes, but where do you lie on that spectrum, and why? Uh, you, you know, I, I think um, it's expensive to go horizontal. That we know. And so you, you maybe have a larger opportunity. Say you may be the best forklift operating IoT platform, and you can make a lot of money. And I think there's lots of money for verticals in this space. We focused on the word thing. And so what we aimed for said we, our theory was that word is so instructive, is that it is massively heterogeneous. So we would aim to be, I guess you could say, the the most configurable and flexible. So no new lines of code, whether it's a door lock and air conditioner appliance, a car even, it would all be able to be normalized or something here. And um, it just takes a lot of money to do that. And as you start to get, we would start to see verticals forming, and we are now, but it's only six years later. We actually at ALA won our first air conditioner company, Q3 last year. Now we may have a third of the world's air conditioning companies as customers. And so you start to see is like, well, they all have Freon. They have all these needs that you can start to build up the stack and go vertical. That was a theory. It's worked, but we have had, to, we've raised over 60 million. And um, it's good that we can attract the equity, I guess, to, to aim that horizontal. But you're, 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 you are horizontal, but you're also vertical, right? I, by air conditioning guys, that's... But only as, as of September. Right, but, you, but you're evolving into that, sort of my point, right. right? Is is And I don't mean to presume what you guys are doing, but because um, we do a little bit of the same thing, which is you, you cast out a net that's horizontal because, frankly, you don't know where you're going to hit. And as you start to see these... Um, areas of higher concentration in particular verticals, then we go and spend more time there. Now, in our case, because it is a disrupting a very standardized industry, we don't go and change the product, but we certainly will go and market and do a different area. Hmm. That, that's how we're here at talking about IoT, right? That's one of those areas where we've seen a lot of demand, so therefore we've, we've gone and verticalized around that. But it's because we cast it at wide net in the beginning, much like I, I kind of took you guys as maybe doing, and then the beauty of that is then 
the air conditioning guys, which in nine months, you've got whatever percentage you said, right? It goes really fast at that point in time because you know what that customer segment needs. To us, it, it is sort of, there's a variable of the maturity of the sophistication of the industry you're in. Um, so, for example, in my house, I have two vertical solutions. I have an S thermostat, and then I also have Hue lighting. And I don't quite feel the need for horizontal solutions across them, but I'm sure I will as I keep layering more devices. In a commercial building, uh, 10 years ago, most buildings would just have an HVAC system, and that's about it. The lighting wasn't a switch. You now have lighting control, you now have distributed generation and solar, you now have car charging stations, you have uh, building automation systems, scheduled thermostats, security. And so buildings have become so complex with so many vertical systems that the facility guys, who remember have a tool, bed, a tool belt and not an iPad, uh, are unable to go and manage those assets. So that's what emerges the need for a horizontal system of systems that can connect the dots and provide a human operator um, the insight that they need to figure out which of these dozens of systems across hundreds of buildings needs attention because they can't possibly log into all of them to figure it out. Now, if there's a problem, they know where to log in and fix it. But that's where we see an emergence for a need of horizontal solutions where um, the complexity has kind of reached a tipping point uh, where it becomes unmanageable. So you guys are actually a horizontal and a large vertical. Yeah, we're a horizontal and a large vertical, yeah, a system of systems. Great. Uh, so one one final question, a little bit of a wild card. Uh, are there for the entrepreneurs uh, in the audience? Are there any uh, gaps or opportunities that you see right now? So any big uh, idea or or a small idea uh, for that matter? But any opportunity that you see is open that, that we want to give away? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> 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 well, I mean, at the risk of, of, of saying something that's been said a lot, and I, I've heard this over and over recently, is IoT security. I think it's a, a, a phenomenal problem, and you know, it's huge, though. Um, in the, in more specifically into our space, in, in the data space, I, I think there's a lot of opportunity yet. Uh, you know, to me, when I look at IoT, yeah, it's great. There's a lot of these devices out there. Really what it's doing is it's brought to bear the ability for us to use data to do all sorts of things, right? Uber's not interesting because somebody figured out how to make a cool iPhone app and, and summon some other paid for driver, right? It's cool because of the data that's being driven by it. Right? All of a sudden you can do these amazing things with data. And I think that's why the, the utility companies are so interested in it. They're not interested in it because they, um, well partly because they can cut some costs, but mostly because now with the data there's a lot they can do. So I think around the data side, talking about horizontal versus vertical, you can start to get very vertical in IoT or any other segment around data and start to create some really amazing things. So I think, you know, again, to give away all the good ideas, but AI in IoT are very focused around the data side. And if you add security in there, you know, Anupam will write you a check. So Is horizontal platform for verticalized data analysis. Yes, with AI. <laughs> with AI. <laughs> And let's not forget the people uh, part of this and the human interface, because I think uh, with all this data, we've introduced an immense amount of complexity and we're making this technology only accessible to engineers. Um, and there is a very large fraction of business users uh, who are in harnessing the value that uh, we're putting in the ground. Um, so there's tons of infrastructure going in. And unfortunately, we're seeing a lot of stranded assets and a lot of customers saying we spend $200,000 with a large building automation system vendor. We haven't seen the value. And the gap is the human interface and the conduit to the business users and the people. So we have to design for people at the end of the day. And that's, that's where the IOE uh, piece comes in, is how do you actually connect the devices and the data to actual people in business process? You know, I, I would just, on these topics, you would say, there, for starting something new, like timing today, there will be floods of data sets coming over the next 10 years that weren't there in the prior 10 years, therefore the big incumbents weren't really focused on knowing how to solve it. That would be one thing now. So of course, whether it's machine learning or all these technologies, uh, these companies based globally don't have the type of capabilities in their own talent pool to solve it. So, you know, especially in the Bay Area here, we, we, you know, companies have that and we think that way. The big thing I'd say is what's your channel? Because you just, think out there and say, well, everyone will also see huge data sets coming. You're really smart, but everyone is going to compete to get access to that data. So it's one thing to maybe have a technology advantage, but I would really encourage the entrepreneur to solve why you think you're going to win in the channel. How are you going to get to that data? 
All right, so I think we all agree that data is the new oil, as they say. So <laughs> that's where the opportunity is. Great. All right, I think it's a wrap. Uh, thank you, uh, panelists, for taking, taking the time. And thanks, everyone, for hanging, hanging out here. It's late in the day. So um, hope, hope uh, you found it of value. Thank you. Thank you.